Good morning. Welcome to the Tapria Internacci class, Claims Against Home Inspectors with Jeff Benny. We are honored that you've joined us today and we have a very large class. Uh, some announcements first so that we can get started. This class is a TREC approved uh, class for two hours of CEs for TREC license inspectors. The class is an Internacci class. So you can also receive credit for the two hours by manually going into your InterNACHI dashboard and putting those hours in yourself. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the class over to Jeff Benny. He has been an, a fantastic help with our agreements and with helping inspectors when there's an issue. So he, please welcome him today and he'll be teaching claims against the home inspector. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you very much. Welcome to everybody. I see the, the chat uh, numbers are just ticking away there. So we've got lots of folks. Um, welcome back to those who, who attended this before. So um, this is my, my class here. I call it Protect Your Six. I've got a military background. For those of you who know what that means, I'm just trying to, to protect your backsides, right? Uh, my job is to, when it, when it comes to representing home inspectors, is just to just to help them, you know, um, to, to defend them in what are largely meritless lawsuits. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, a little bit about myself first before we get started. Um, I've been practicing law for 22, three years. Uh, prior to that, I was an FBI agent here in Houston, Texas for eight years, um, having fun playing cops and robbers, chasing down bank robbers and, and stuff. And uh, prior to that, I was in the military, as I said. Um, graduated from West Point back in 1991. So um, really kind of made a career out of helping folks that have been treated unfairly. And that is, is really why I enjoy uh, representing home inspectors, because like I said, uh, you know, 95 times out of 100, uh, the lawsuits are, are without merit. Um, and, and as we'll see uh, in this class, uh, that doesn't really matter. <laughs> um, you can you could do a great job and still end up getting sued. So um, as Brenda said, hold your questions to the end. Um, feel free to put them in the chat box and, and Paul and Brenda can read those to me um, at the end and we can go through them. I really don't know how long this is going to take. Sometimes I go on tangents and tell war stories. So I'm guessing it'll probably take a total of about you know, hour 15 to get through the presentation and then we'll have questions. Um, at the end of my, um, towards the end of the presentation, I'm gonna be talking about uh, showing you sample agreements. And uh, I'm gonna take a break right before we get into that just to give everybody five minutes to, to, to freshen up so we can uh, finish up strong. So I'll, uh, Brenda or, or Paul, just remind me if, we, if I just keep on trucking, uh, we need to take a little bit of a break. This is the second class that I've uh, had for InterNACHI on this topic. Um, after the first one, we had such a positive response, uh, especially from my offer to give everybody a draft inspection agreement, uh, as well as my offer to review any agreement that you have for free. Uh, my email contact information is on the screen now. If you have a, an agreement that you uh, want me to review, email it to me, I'll do it for free. Um, and I'll do it, you'll, you'll see, I'll respond pretty quickly, uh, likely within 24 hours, and give you ideas, uh, things that are not correct, uh, things you need to add, and, and I will also be happy to email a copy of my draft agreement to everybody. And, and my draft agreement is a, um, is a living, breathing animal. I'm always making changes to it as I go through cases or as I learn of other things. So in my opinion, it's the most up-to-date agreement that there is. Um, you know, there may be other ones out there, but I, I, I really like this one. Um, it, I also started from that last um, group an email list. <clears throat> Everybody that wanted to and that I corresponded with, uh, I added to an email group. And I promised to do a couple things with that email group. I'm going to add folks. If you want to be added to it, let me know. Uh, I promised to email you with any suggested changes to that draft agreement. Like I said, it's, it's constantly changing. 
I promise to keep you up to speed on any significant legal issues in the area of home inspection, litigation. Number three, I promise not to just bombard you guys with any, I'm not trying to sell you anything uh, or you know, send you spam. So I'm not gonna, you're not gonna get a ton of stuff from me, but when you do, it'll, it'll, it'll mean something. For those of you that attended last time, uh, this, inspect, this, this, this class instruction is gonna be very similar, I think, to the, to the last one. But like I said, things change and I'm, I'm definitely adding things. <clears throat> some important clauses um, to the to the agreement. So, um, Paul and Brenda, I think if you, I don't know if you can, but if you want to replace the last InterNACHI YouTube video that we did with this one, that would probably be a good idea. Um, so last time I did this, I mistakenly assumed all the inspectors online were from Texas. Uh, we, I learned during that that it, it was not the case. And I know, I know now that there are many of you um, that are not in Texas. So for those of you that aren't, I would just say to you, um, if you do nothing else, you know, listen to these points and, and use my agreement as a basis. Chances are your law in whatever state you're, you're in is either the same or very similar, um, or perhaps less, less constringent as, as Texas law. So if you do nothing else, just use, use my stuff. Um, if you want to take it a step further, take my agreement, find somebody that does home inspector defense in your area and, and have them, you know, tweak it or make some suggestions that are pertinent to your state. So, okay. So, uh, here's what we're going to talk about today. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to talk mostly about the inspection agreement and the important clauses that you need to have in that inspection agreement. And here's the ones that we're going to talk about today, predominantly limitation and liability, because that's, a, that's just a really good one. Um, we're also going to talk about briefly, you know, whether or not you guys should incorporate. Uh, probably the vast majority of you guys are out there um, as a you know individual or maybe a DBA, there's some reasons why you should incorporate. We're going to talk about the consent to settle provision in your insurance agreement. Many of you probably have that and don't even know it. We'll talk about what that means. Really, really some basics on report writing. I know you guys get a lot of that from your from your classes, and I don't want to harp on it too much. Uh, and then we'll finish up with some do's and don'ts. Uh, again, you know, really pretty some general stuff, and then we'll end with some some questions. So home inspector lawsuit, here's what normally happens when a home inspector is involved. Um, there's a misconception that you're only going to get sued if you do a bad report. And I'm here to tell you that is not the case. You can do every single thing right and still find yourself sued. And it's frustrating. Um, it's just the way our legal system is set up. Now, you know, chances are if you get sued and you haven't done anything wrong, I can get you out um, at some point. Um, but I, you know, what I can't do is stop somebody from suing you, even if you've done everything correctly. Homeowners do not understand your role. Um, every single time that I ask a homeowner in a deposition, you know, what did you think the inspector was going to do? The response is, is always, I thought they would tell me every single thing that was wrong with the house. Now, everybody here that's listening knows that's not the case, uh, but that's what homeowners think. And that's what's going to get you into a lawsuit. After that, um, they start to, after they close, they start to notice little things, right? Um, maybe it's a, a weird smell or maybe it's a, some water damage or, or, you know, whatever it is. And they become dissatisfied and that grows into what we call buyer's remorse. Once they get to that, that point of having buyer's remorse, um, that's when they start looking for a lawyer, okay? <clears throat> they find a lawyer. Um, 90, so, so I represent a lot of home inspectors. I do a lot of these cases on the defense. 99% of the lawyers that are on the other side are just one-offs. They do all kinds of other things, personal injury, family, whatever it is. And they, they have a client that calls them and says, Hey, what can we do? So they sue, but they've never sued a home inspector before. <clears throat> and once you're in that lawsuit, um, it's like I said, it's difficult for me to get you out unless you have a really good agreement. 
you end up staying for months or years. In the end, uh, if I don't get you out because of a good agreement, likely you're going to have to pay some sort of small settlement to get out of the lawsuit. Um, typically, that's less than ten thousand dollars from from what I've seen. Uh, depends on the in, the carrier and the facts of the case. Uh, usually, it's it's actually far less than that. Uh, but you know, the hard thing to swallow is um, you know you could you could spend a couple you know months or years of litigation not do anything wrong and end up having to pay something just to get out. And that's frustrating. We'll talk about that. So if you can hear that, I don't know if you can or not, but apparently you're doing some construction in my building. I apologize in advance. Um, so let's talk about the inspection agreement. First, 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 please have one. I know that there are people that are on this call that have done inspections for 25 years and have never used an agreement and they've never had a problem. I guarantee you there's people on this call that, that are thinking that right now. <clears throat> You've come to the right class, if that's you. My sole purpose of being here today is to convince each and every one of you to get a signed agreement from every client that you have, um, and then to get a good one, right? One that you can use and get it signed. It's not in my best interest to, for you to have a good inspection agreement, if you think about it. If you have a good inspection agreement, I'm only going to bill you know, a couple thousand dollars on your case and get you out early. If you don't have a good inspection agreement, I'm going to be representing you for two years and billing your insurance company the whole time. So, you know, from, from a benefit standpoint, it's better for me if you're in it for the long haul. All that being said, I'm begging you guys to get a really good inspection agreement, get it signed at the proper time. Um, and it will, it will make a world of difference. Uh, if, if and when you get sued. Make it separate from the report itself. I see a lot of sort of hybrid ones. Um, and as we'll talk about with some of those clauses that, that I want you to have in there, they need to stick out. And so the, the minute a two page contract becomes part of a 38 page report, it automatically gets kind of lost. And we don't want some of those things getting lost. <clears throat> It's okay um, to be in the same PDF form, like if you email them a, a copy of the report with the contract, um, but it should be labeled and separate. Just don't make it look like additional boilerplate language. Get it signed. Um, we'll talk about how it can be effectively used in a lawsuit if it isn't signed. It's possible that it can still you know, it doesn't have to be signed, but um, it becomes harder to get you out if it's not signed. So my advice to you would be just get in the habit of, of establishing a, a, a process and get that thing signed before you do your inspection, certainly before you give your report. Okay. Get it signed by someone with authority. We're going to talk about that as well. Um, there are cases where somebody gets it signed and I show it to the other lawyer and he says, well, that person, you know, that's not the homeowner. That's the girlfriend or whatever of the homeowner and it's not valid. And I end up having to fight about that. Uh, online signatures are fine. And in fact, I think kind of preferable. Um, We'll, we'll talk about that again. So, um, like I said, it may be, let me go back. It may be enforceable if it's not signed, but um, definitely, definitely my preference to get it signed. <clears throat> you wanna try to avoid giving them the contract at the same time that you give them a report. I have a case right now where the plaintiff is just trying to say the inspector told her it was a receipt because he gave it to her at the exact same time that he gave the report. Um, Plus, it sort of makes sense if you think about it. Um, it's hard to say that those clauses that they received after, you know, the, the inspection was done were agreed upon and enforceable. All of the clauses that we want to have, um, that we want to use against them, we want to make sure that they're agreed upon and signed before you even do your work. Okay. If it's not signed, it absolutely has to be given before the report. 
Um, if you're not going to get them signed, it also has to have some very important language in it. And we'll talk about that. Um, and this is, this is it, the reliance. Um, there's going to have to be a clause in there that says, again, this is if it's not signed. If you rely on this report at all, then you, then you are agreeing to all the terms that are in it. Okay. That way, when I'm taking their deposition, if it's not signed, I can say, well, you relied on this report when you were purchasing your house, right? They have to say yes. And then I go to this clause and said, well, since you replied up, you, you know, you agreed to, to all the terms in it, right? It's hard for them to say no to that. So <clears throat> each of those unsigned agreements are, are um, governed by the facts of the case. But um, if the plaintiff can show that they never read it and never agreed to it, it's going to be difficult to enforce it. Bottom line is there's wiggle room for the plaintiffs. I try to, you know, the less wiggle room I can, I can give them, the easier it is for me to, to get you out of the case. Okay, let's talk about these important clauses. All right. You're allowed to limit your liability for a lawsuit in a contract, okay? This is, this is the first and probably the most important provision of all the ones we're gonna talk about today. It's called limitation of liability. What this means is if you, even if you did something wrong and you caused them a bunch of damage, you can, you can have a clause in there that says, no matter what, the maximum amount that you can get against me is a hundred bucks or 500 bucks or the amount of the inspection fee, whatever it is. That's enforceable. Um, you're allowed to limit you and the other person that agreed to the, to the contract are allowed to limit your liability. And home inspectors are not the only people that are allowed to do this. And the reason is because if you can't limit your liability, you're earning a very small fee, but exposing yourself to tons of, of damages. So the, the public policy is, look, we, 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 you know, we can't put these folks out of business. It's okay for them to limit their liability. Same thing with people that do like fire alarm installation, right? Um, you know, they're probably getting paid 500 bucks to install smoke detectors and they limit their liability because if the house burns down, the people are going to sue them and they're going to be sued for you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Well, it's just not fair to hold them responsible each and every time. So that's the public policy as to why you're allowed to limit your liability. It has to be conspicuous. What does that mean? It's got to stick out. If it doesn't stick out, it's not enforceable. I don't care how good the language that you have in the contract is. If it doesn't stick out on the contract, it's not going to be enforceable. Uh, for those people that are not in Texas, um, I'm betting, I'll bet you a hundred bucks that's the same in your, in your state, right? So because it's such a powerful clause, courts have said, look, we need, you know, we want to make sure that the plaintiff, a reasonable person would have read this. And that's what the law says. Something, what does it mean to be conspicuous? Something must appear on the face of the contract to attract the attention of a reasonable person when he or she looks at it. <clears throat> so anything that's, you know, contrasting type, bold is great, underline is great, all caps is great, in color, um, if you set it apart, you know, somehow from the rest of the, of the uh, language, different font works, Change the size, that works too. Put a box around it, that's great. Some combination of all of the above is even better. Um, any one of these things, if, let's say you just put it in bold, I'm gonna of course say that's conspicuous, you should have seen it. The lawyer on the other side is gonna say, yeah, you know, well, there's a couple of other things in the contract that are bold. Maybe that doesn't stick out quite so much. So my advice would be to use two or more of these things um, you know, I, I, I've never had any inspector tell me that somebody refused to sign an agreement because of a limitation of liability clause that was included. So my, my advice would be use as many or even all of these things, you know, because that's going to make it an absolute 
you know, something that they can't argue with. If you don't have, if it's not conspicuous, even if you have all the right language, it's not enforceable, period. You might as well not even have it in there. And we're going to look at some, some uh, sample agreements, and I'm going to tell you what, what is and what isn't. You guys will probably be able to point it out to me by the time we get there. All right. Next clause that I want you guys to include in your contract, attorney's fees, okay? Normally, plaintiffs can get attorney's fees in a contract dispute, but a defendant cannot, okay? That means the plaintiff has no skin in the game. Why would they not bring a lawsuit against you? If they lose, the worst that happens is they don't have to pay any money, okay? This clause changes the game, okay? you're allowed to put in the contract that the prevailing party wins and gets attorney's fees, okay? That means that if the plaintiff files suit against you and loses, not only do they lose the case, they could end up paying your attorney's fees. This is big, okay? Um, <clears throat> the ability to recover attorney's fees is a huge detriment to suing you. It's a huge obstacle for the plaintiffs to overcome. Like I said, it's one thing to bring a lawsuit when the worst case scenario is that you just don't win any money. It's a whole different ball game when I explain to that when I explain to that plaintiff in a deposition and his lawyer, if his lawyer doesn't know this, um, worst case scenario, not just you lose, but you're going to pay my attorney's fees. <clears throat> it changes mediation. It changes settlement negotiations. It's it's great. Make it say that the client agrees to pay the inspector, not prevailing party. This is a very sort of nuanced um, difference. And, and why I want it in there is because if you say the inspector prevails um, instead of prevailing party gets it, then it only works for you. It doesn't work for the plaintiff, okay? Um, if it says prevailing party and the, and the uh, and the plaintiff wins, that gives him a right to recover attorney's fees from you in a case where he might not otherwise be allowed to do that. Not all cases, um, plaintiffs can recover attorney's fees. So you wanna make sure it benefits you, not the other side. Uh, and believe it or not, you're allowed to do that. All right, notice clauses. What's a notice clause? <clears throat> Clauses that require the client to give you a heads up within a certain amount of time after they discover a perceived defect, okay? The purpose of this, of course, is to get you out there as soon as possible, give you an opportunity to reinspect so that you can see it and find out, was this there when I was there, okay? You can resolve disputes very quickly in a, you know, before attorneys get involved, right? Lots of times attorneys get involved and it just, it goes down a road that, it's hard to stop, but perhaps you can resolve something if you go out there early. It also gives you an opportunity to capture what they're saying, because if they don't let you out there, oftentimes they'll repair it and we'll never get a chance to see what they're complaining about, right? It's all been repaired by the time you even get involved. <clears throat> so the sneaky little thing that you can do with a notice clause is um, it's one thing to say, hey, you know, you got to let me know within 10 days and give me an opportunity to reinspect. But you can also say, if you fail to do this, you waive all of your claims. Okay, you got to have the right language in a contract, and we'll talk about that. But you can say that. You can say that if you fail to give proper notice per the, the terms in this agreement, you hereby waive everything. If you're signing a waiver before they even know they they're, have a perceived injury, it's like a release, right? It's basically saying, you know, I hereby release any claims and, you know, that I have against you in the, in the future. And because it's so powerful, like the limitation of liability, it has certain requirements, okay? You can't just say it in the, in the, in the contract. Number one is it's called an express negligence rule. <clears throat> um, you have to actually say that it waives any and all claims, including the negligence of the inspector, okay? You have to use that language or the courts have said, 
you can waive all the other claims, but we're not letting you get rid of the negligence claim against the home inspector. So you got to use the right terminology and it's in my contract. We'll show it to you. It also has to be conspicuous. Same requirements as the limitation of liability clause, bold, color, highlight, whatever it is that you want to do. Like the limitation of liability clause, if this is poorly worded or if it doesn't have the conspicuousness, it's useless. Okay, it's just print on a paper. Um, okay. Limit the statute of limitations. That's kind of a wordy thing. What's that mean? So normally um, a statute of limitations is, is um, it's a timeline, a time frame in which a person has to bring a claim where they know that they've been injured, know or should have known. Okay. For most claims in Texas and, and across the country, most claims, there's a two year statute of limitations for breach of contract, fraud, and some other things deceptive trade practices, four years, okay? It just gives a, a timeline where they can't just wait forever, right? I mean, you guys are working folks, you don't have to wait forever thinking you're gonna get sued for something you did 20 years ago. So it's just reasonable to have a timeline. You can limit that, you can shorten that in a contract, okay? <clears throat> You can say, you can have a clause that says the person that's signing this agreement agrees to limit the statute of limitations for any and all claims to one year. Okay, that's important because lots of times it takes longer than a year for them to actually, you know, get their stuff together and file the lawsuit. And how nice would that be for them to come at you 18 months down the road and you show them this agreement and they've you know, they've waived every, every two year statute of limitation claim. It does not, it, it, in, in Texas, you cannot limit breach of contract claims to less than two years. So the way it's got to read is, um, person who signs this agreement agrees to limit all of their claims to one year, except breach of contract, which is limited to two years. Okay, um, that's important. Another important clause to have is the arbitration slash mediation, uh, some sort of alternative dispute resolution. Um, arbitration is an alternative to regular court. This is just kind of an aside. I'm gonna tell you what the difference is between the two. A lot of people think they're the same thing, they're not. And arbitration is a lot like regular lawsuit court you have, except you have an arbitrator, a single person who's not a judge. Usually it's a lawyer or a retired judge. It's informal. It's usually less expensive than regular traditional litigation, but it's binding. If you agree to use arbitration, you go through the whole dispute, whatever that arbitrator says is binding. Mediation is something that you can have, whether you're in arbitration or regular court, and it's just an informal get together, sit down, attempt to settle. That's all that is. And you can go to mediation with an independent third party who's trying to get the two sides to agree and the two sides don't agree, it's not binding. They just agree to go their separate ways and go back to, to the lawsuit, okay? <clears throat> but it's kind of a nice thing to have at least if you want to enforce it, okay? I'll tell you this, plaintiffs are never gonna want to enforce arbitration or mediation. So this is something at your disposal if you want to use it. Just because it's in there does not mean that you have to use it. Typically, I don't like to use it unless there are a ton of other uh, parties in the lawsuit or if the lawsuit, you would find yourself in a specific venue, like a really plaintiff friendly venue, like down in the valley. If you're a home inspector down in the valley, you don't want to be a defendant down there. If you can use an arbitration agreement to pull it out of that venue and put it in some other place, I would recommend you enforcing that, having it in your agreement and enforcing it. Um, like I said, you don't have to enforce it if you don't want to, um, but it, sometimes it can be helpful. Unlike all of the other clauses that we're gonna talk about today, arbitration clauses don't have to have, it doesn't need specific language. 
It doesn't have to stick out. Judges love these things. Why is that? Because it gets rid of a case on their docket, right? If they can get rid of a case and have it go somewhere else for somebody else to deal with, they're going to enforce it. And that's how, that's how it's used. In fact, there are cases where you go like halfway through the lawsuit and one of the parties decides, you know, what, I don't like this judge. I don't like this venue. I want to get out of here. We're going to move to enforce the arbitration clause. And the other side's like, wait a second, we've been litigating for a year. You can't do that. And the judge says, oh, yes, you can go somewhere else. So it's very easily enforceable um, in, in, in the case. All right, this is a new, it's not a new clause, it's new to my agreement, it's new to this class. Indemnity, what does indemnity mean? Um, what happens in a situation where an agreement is signed by the home inspector and, a, and a, um, one of the home, potential homeowners and nobody else? Let's say it's signed by, um, you know, the, the, the wife or the girlfriend, is it enforceable against the, that person's husband or significant other? The, the law is kind of iffy about that, right? In fact, it's probably not enforceable against anybody else that's, that is involved in the, the, the purchase of the house, but didn't sign the contract. That's a big deal, right? How many times are you doing agreements or inspections for folks that have you know multiple people moving in i've got a case right now that involves an explosion and it's a really good agreement and the husband signed it girlfriend didn't sign it and the um the the daughter of the of the of the couple didn't sign it so <clears throat> it's it's difficult it's hard if not impossible for me to waive my wife's rights or my kids rights Okay, that's the thinking behind this. So how do you handle it? What we do is we get the signing party to agree to indemnify us, okay? To indemnify means to compensate another party for losses that party, this gets a little legal and a little technical. We're gonna walk through this. <clears throat> In other words, you get that client that signs your agreement to pay for your attorney's fees and damages, if there are any, if anyone else sues the inspector, okay? How great is that, right? It doesn't sound like something that even should be allowed or legal, but it is. Homeowner, wife, husband, let's go through an example, okay? So let's say inspector and the client, who in this case is gonna be the wife, signs a very well-drafted inspection agreement, including a limitation of liability clause, okay? They get in a dispute, the wife sues the inspector, the inspector or his lawyer immediately turns around and says, hey, FYI, I don't think I had anything wrong, but even if I did, here's my $300 due to the limitation of liability agreement that your, your wife signed. Thank you for your time. I'm out of the lawsuit, okay? Plaintiff lawyer comes in and he does his best Lee Corso impression and says, not so fast. He amends his lawsuit, drops all of the claims brought by the wife, and instead adds all the claims brought from a non-signing husband, okay? So how do we get out of this? Without an indemnity, indemnity clause, we might be stuck. With an indemnity clause, what I would do is send a letter to the wife and say, now, mind you, she doesn't have any claims in a lawsuit. I'll say, look, here's the contract. You have an indemnity agreement. What this means is you owe me, inspector, for all of the attorney's fees that I'm going to incur and any of the damages that your husband might get in the lawsuit, okay? In effect, what's happening is the husband's just suing the wife, okay? You're just kind of the go-between, but... Um, the, the wife is going to end up paying. These are absolutely enforceable, okay? <clears throat> However, they are also, because they're so powerful, they're also required to be conspicuous, just like the waiver clause, just like the limitation of liability clause, okay? So, like I said, 
For those of you that were in the class last time, we did not talk about indemnity agreements, all right? This has been added to it and I've sent it out to everybody that was on that email distribution. It's now in the current version of my draft agreement and um, anybody that wants it will have this. How are we doing on time? Okay, we've been going for about 40 minutes. All right, last, uh, I think it might be the last. So the reliance clause, we talked a little bit about this. <clears throat> this is only really important if and when the agreement is not signed, okay? This is an example of what it might look like. Um, after I have this in the agreement, I get the, the person who says, wait, that's not enforceable against me because I didn't sign it. I get them to admit that they relied on the report, which they, like I said, they have to admit this. And then I get them to admit that then it's now enforceable. Okay. <clears throat> Do not use this as an alternative to signing. Okay. This does not make it a slam dunk and as effective as somebody signing it. It's just not. Okay, so do not, for those of you who don't like having somebody, you know, sign an agreement, you think it kind of creates a little bit of friction. This is not a, you know, sort of get out of jail free card and, and telling you not to get it signed. Please get it signed. All right. So, um, Paul and Brandon, we've been going for about 40 minutes, I think. Um, well, let me go through a couple of agreements first and then we'll break. Uh, cause it's, we, we, we still got a little bit of time. <clears throat> All right. Here's my first agreement. Let me go through. There's actually like seven or eight of them here. All right. Here's the first one. I've redacted the name of the inspection company and all these. I hope, I hope I have. Um, I don't expect you to see this. I'm going to blow up the parts that I do want you to look at. This is page two. Okay. So this is just a, um, short three page, uh, agreement. Uh, for some reason, on page two, they've got the signature at the bottom, and page three, they add some additional stuff, which is a little bit odd. I don't, I don't like that, but you know, it is what it is. Everybody's got their own own thing. All right, going back to page one, I've blown up the clause. I want you to look at. Okay, first, let's look at this clause. Um, the client agrees to notify the inspector in writing of any complaints or items in question within 14 days of discovery. All right, what do we got? This is a waiver clause, right? By the way, all the blocking and underlining I've done myself, that was not in the original agreement. Okay, so that's <clears throat> first and foremost, this waiver clause does not meet, meet the conspicuous requirements. So without even looking at it any further, it's not enforceable, okay? Does it say anything about, let's see, where is the actual waiver? Claimant's failure to permit the inspector to reinspect the item issue shall mean the client has waived any claims for a breach of this agreement at any time beyond one year after the date of the agreement. Okay. Does it mention negligence specifically? It does not. Okay. So you have not waived any negligence claims. Have you effectively, this is sort of a hodgepodge of a waiver and a statute of limitations um, uh, limiting clause in one, um, <clears throat> but does it effectively waive breach of contract claims? No, it does not. It doesn't say anything about breach of contract being two years. So, so far we've got really three things in here, none of which are effective. Oh, sorry about that. I should have blown that up before I, before I talked about it. But like I said, this first paragraph here includes all three of those things that are not effective. The next paragraph, dispute resolution, when either party requests, if there's ever a claim or a demand or cause of action, claims shall be resolved by binding arbitration in Harris County, Texas. Okay, two things. This is a this is a um, dispute resolution arbitration clause, right? We know that's going to be effective. It's also a choice of venue clause, Harris County, Texas. If this inspector performed an inspection down in the valley and got sued, we could bring an arbitration in Harris County, Texas, a much more um, defendant friendly um, venue than the valley. Not a great venue for defendants, but better, okay? <clears throat> and we can do that. You can choose venues. You can choose arbitration. We can enforce this if we want to, or we can just leave it alone and not enforce it.
the page three of this first agreement on the bottom, I'll blow it up here. The inspector's liability here under shall be limited and fixed in an equal amount to three times the inspection of the fee paid. What is this? This is this inspector's attempt to limit the liability by adding this clause. Take this box out. And uh, if I could take the underline out, I would, because that's something I added, not the inspector, okay? If that underlining was in there, that'd be good. It's not. So without it, does this limitation of liability stick out to anybody in a three-page agreement where it's on page three in the last se section? It does not. This limitation of liability clause is absolutely unenforceable, okay? I probably would not even bring it up to the other side. I, maybe I would, but, you know, sometimes lawyers don't, you know, they're just not very good, and I may bring it up just in case he, he, he doesn't know this. <clears throat> but it's if, if, if that opposing counsel, if she brings it up and she fights it, I'm going to lose it 100 times out of 100. So in summary, this you know, three page contract, lots of good language in there. Lots of good language. They definitely made an attempt, but really none of the juicy stuff that I want in there is enforceable. Agreement number two. Okay. This is an interesting one. Um, if the inspector is out there, who's this is, um, we're, we're actually still in litigation on this lawsuit. Okay. On this, on this agreement, this is a one pager. I like that, very simple. Um, it does not have really any of the uh, clauses that we've talked about here today, except one. It does have a limitation of liability clause. In fact, really, that's the only clause that's in this agreement. I mean, you can look and see, you know, there's basically three paragraphs. The first one that I've got boxed out is the limitation of liability. The second paragraph talks about it being, you know, this is the entire agreement between the parties and the third one's about paying. So <clears throat> this is it. So um, this is kind of an odd one, right? So again, without the box, this is the limitation of liability agreement. This one, let's see, tells you why they're doing it. Last sentence, inspector's liability shall be limited and fixed in amount equal to three times the inspection fee paid. Very good. So without it, without that box, does this stick out? Normally, I would say absolutely not, okay? However, there is case law in Texas that says, look, you know, we get that whole conspicuous thing. It's got to stick out. But some contracts are just so short and so easily readable. Look, any reasonable person or who even put their eyeballs on this would see it. There's a case that says exactly that. So that this issue is pending as we speak. I'm waiting for the judge to rule on this. Uh, if he doesn't rule my way, we'll appeal it. Uh, I'll let you guys know. I'm, I'm very interested to see what he does with this agreement. But so I like the brevity of this, but how nice would it have been if this was just bold or underlined or something like that? That would have been a no brainer. All right. Um, let's go for agreement number three. All right. This is a two page agreement. This is page one, as you can see, very busy, lots of stuff going on. Um, disregard the red box at the, at the bottom. That's mine. This is page two. Okay. Again, all the red boxes are mine. You can see from, from page one and page two, the headers, are all in caps and they're all in bold. That's a good thing, but not really a good thing that they're all like that, right? So um, let's look at each one of them. Here's the limitation of liability clause. The language is fine. Uh, is it conspicuous? Okay, like I said, the heading is in bold, the heading is in all caps, but that's it. And you know, it's no different than any of these other paragraphs. Um, you know, likely not enforceable, pretty sure, right? It's like that new commercial they got out. It's pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that that's a, 
it, what you're wearing is a is a uh, uh, parachute. Um, it's better to be definitely sure than pretty sure. <clears throat> if it's solidly enforceable, what I do is I tell the other side, you're done, and they agree usually. Uh, if it's a maybe, I tell the lawyer that he's done and he disagrees and we end up having to fight about it for a long time. Even like I said, maybe even an appeal. So that's the difference between maybe and definite in, in, in the legal terms. Honestly, this one's probably not enforceable. Page two, uh, you've got this dispute resolution clause. Uh, let's blow it up. Okay. Let's see. Uh, client has to report to the inspector within 10 days of discovery. Uh, company agrees to respond within five days. This is kind of a long convoluted um, notice clause. <clears throat> uh, client agrees not to make any alterations or repairs before I can get out there. Uh, failure to timely notify the company and allow adequate time to investigate. Um, and reinspect shall constitute a complete bar and waiver to any and all claims. Okay, that's now a waiver claim, not just a notice claim. And it has those requirements because it's so powerful. Um, so before I get into the rest of that paragraph, let's talk about the notice and the waiver. Um, is it conspicuous? Nope, not enforceable, basically uh, useless. Okay, the last half of that uh, paragraph is all about arbitration and mediation. I don't even know. To, I don't even need to read it. Uh, it's enforceable. All right. And the very last part of this uh, agreement is the statute of limitations. Parties agree that no claim. Blah blah blah. More than one year after the date of inspection. Okay. So what he's done here is say you have to bring any and all claims um, prior to one year, or if you don't, they're waived. Is that effective? Has he, has, he ex, has he expressly mentioned negligence? No, he's not. Um, has he expressly mentioned that breach of contract or two years? No, they have not. Um, so it's still effective as to other claims, but they still have negligence and they still have breach of contract. So, you know, those are the two most common claims anyway. So this really hasn't done you any good. Let's look at the fourth one here. This is another three page agreement. This is the first page, nothing really, really need to look at. Uh, this is page two. You can see the clause in the middle of the agreement. We're gonna talk a little bit more. It jumps out at you. That beige color is not mine. That's actually something that was added to the agreement. And then page three, we'll talk about a couple of those clauses on the top. Going back to page two. All right, this is the limitation of liability clause that this this inspector put in like a beige um, background, unlike anything else in the agreement. I love it. Um, it's also, um, let's see if we go backwards. It's also that box around it is not mine. Okay, that's his, that's good. <clears throat> it's also in bold. The part that really, you know, needs to be is in bold. Client's exclusive remedy against this inspector is limited to a maximum recovery of damage equal to the amount of the inspection fee. That's in bold, okay? It's also a different font. You can sort of see that it's in italics, okay? That helps. Um, this one is absolutely, uh, oops, let me go back. This one is absolutely enforceable, okay? Um, I say absolutely. There's a couple knucklehead judges out there that just will deny every summary judgment. So, if that happens, we'll appeal it and we'll win all day long. Um, but this one's enforceable. This is great. This is a great limitation of liability clause. Moving on to page uh, three. <clears throat> At the top of it is the, dis well, actually this is page two, still the dispute resolution clause. Um, let's talk, let's look it out. All right. Uh, within 10 business days. Okay, good. That's a notice. Inspector agrees to respond promptly, okay. Within 15 days, client further agrees, no alterations or repairs, that's good. Client, okay, this is in bold. Client understands and agrees that any failure to timely notify inspector and allow time to investigate, blah, 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 shall constitute a complete waiver of any and all claims, period. Okay, 
Is it conspicuous? Yeah, I think it is. It's kind of hidden in a dispute resolution paragraph, but it's in bold. I, I like that. Could be could be set off in a waiver claim, a, a waiver clause will be a little bit better, but it's bold. I think I like that. <clears throat> Does it include anything about the negligence of the inspector? Has he effectively waived negligence claims? Nothing, nothing about negligence, not gonna be able to waive that claim. So if in effect, it's it's sort of useless. Okay, then, then briefly talking about the um, mediation. Okay, that's, we know that's, we know that's enforceable. Um, next paragraph talking about the arbitration. I don't need to read it. We know that's enforceable. Okay. Statute of limitations. Uh, let's see. Agrees. More, it has to be brought more. Anything brought more than one year after the date of inspection uh, is waived. Okay. Does he mention negligence? No, he does not. Does he mention breach of contract being two years? No, he does not. So again, they can bring negligence, they can bring, bring, bring contracts. This clause is basically useless to me. Okay, here we go. Agreement number five, we got two or three or four other ones. Here we go. This is a three pager, um, <clears throat> nothing much to see here on page one. This is page two, not much to see here either. Uh, here's page three with all the juicy stuff. And then page four, is an agreement that's been digitally accepted. And I saw some questions about this and we'll talk about this. Okay, while it's on my mind, I personally believe th there are those of you who are out there that have some kind of system on your computer that allows all of this to take place over the internet and digitally, okay? And you know, as soon as they, schedule an inspection you know, i don't know the exact you know course but let's say they schedule an inspection online they immediately get a copy of your contract sent to them they they i don't know if they review or not doesn't really matter they have the opportunity to review it and they can't move forward actually i think it's probably before you even get to schedule an inspection you can't even schedule an inspection unless you digitally sign this limitate or this this a contract okay um, for those of you, <clears throat> my email is going to come back up at the end. Anybody that's using a system like this um, that they like, I want to know what it is because I've been talking about this for years and I don't even know what the system's called, but I really, really like this. It's great. It takes a lot of the, uh, the thinking out of the process. It takes the awkwardness out of the process, right? You don't have to sit there and say, hey, before I get started here, I'd like you to sign this. Take your time, read it. You know, it, that's kind of awkward, right? That's the kind. That's the thing we're trying to avoid. Um, but this takes it out of it, right? Everything's done digitally. You're not. You're not staring at them. Everybody's just going to sign it to move forward. They're just so happy about their home that they want to get it inspected. Boom! It's signed. It's absolutely as effective as any other signature. So, what, just wanted to hit that while we're talking about it. <clears throat> um, it's it's great. All right. Let's look at the limitation of liability clause. Again, the red box is mine. <clears throat> so the only thing that you have here is all caps. Okay, so so going backwards, um, does it? If you're looking at the whole thing there, does that stick out to you? Sort of, right? Uh, you've given me some something to work with. Okay, without looking at the language there, I'm sure it says. Uh, last sentence there, client agrees to liability being limited to the amount of inspection fee paid. Great language, no problem, but I'm going to be in for a fight. All right, I'm telling you that right now. I wish, sure wish that there was more to it. Um, dispute resolution. Again, we've got a hybrid notice waiver dispute resolution, clau three clauses sandwiched into one, okay? Client agrees to notify the inspector in writing within 10 days of the date of the, uh, the client discovers the basis, blah, blah, blah. Client agrees to allow reinspection. That's good. Client won't disturb or repair. That's great. Uh, client further agrees that the inspector can either conduct reinspection himself. Um, okay, so this one is a <clears throat> notice. There is no waiver clause, okay? It's just basically saying you got to let me do it. There's no teeth to it. If you don't let them do it, 
where's the where's the penalty for not letting them do that right um so you know is that enforceable i mean what, what can i say this, there's nothing i can make him do if he didn't do those things i can give him a hard time about it in his deposition you didn't give us time to inspect did you you didn't give us an opportunity to look at it before you did the repairs did you um but in the end it doesn't really matter last sentence there is the dispute resolution binding arbitration we know that's we know that's enforceable um and here's your attorney's fees provision the inspecting the client agree that the event any dispute or controversy arises as a result of the agreement blah 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 the prevailing party in that dispute shall be entitled to recover all reasonable necessary attorney's fees okay i like they have it in there does not need to be conspicuous that's going to be enforceable however this is the one I want to switch, right? Instead of prevailing party, I want it to say client in the event that the client is not successful, client agrees to pay inspector's attorney's fees, okay? The way this is written right now, that client can use this clause against you. <clears throat> okay, number six. It's another one pager, okay? I like the fact that it's easy. It's simple. It's on one page. Other than that, it's really busy. Okay. And only a couple of things on here kind of jump out at you and none of them are what I need it to, to be. Okay. Now, like I said, there's that one case in Texas that says, Hey, it's one page. You know, I think the person, any, any reasonable person who's presented with this should see it. I'm not sure that applies to this one. Okay, I like that other one we talked about. It was only one paragraph. This one is a little bit, just too much going on here uh, for a judge to say a reasonable person would notice a limitation of liability clause. Well, let's look at it, okay? Here's the limitation of liability clause, okay? I popped it out, okay? It's paragraph number six. Looking at that just from afar, does paragraph six stick out to you? Nope. Hold on a second. Actually, it's not paragraph six. It's uh, can't find what paragraph is. I guess it doesn't matter. Um, all right. So, did I go through limitation of liability first? Oh, that's where I'm screwing up. This is not a limitation of liability. This is a notice waiver. Okay, that's paragraph six. Um, it's not conspicuous. Uh, no mention of negligence not enforceable may may as well not even have it in there uh, attorney's fees simple okay if customer institutes an illegal action against the inspector uh, inspector fails to prevail on all causes of action alleged customer shall be liable to company okay i like this one a lot okay because the because the uh the customer cannot use this against the inspector it only goes one way i like that a lot it's enforceable Actual damage, here's your limitation of liability. Paragraph eight, uh, does paragraph eight stick out? Not at all. Actual damages limited to the amount of inspection fee, might as well not even have it in there. Customer, this is your reliance uh, sentence that we've talked about before. Customer by accepting this report or relying upon it in any way, expressly agrees to all of these limitations and disclaimers. Um, that way, if it's not signed, like this one wasn't, if you look down at the bottom here, it's got the inspector's signature and not the client's. Um, possibly I can use this against them, but it's still subject to all the other conspicuous requirements, so it doesn't really matter. Last inspection agreement I want to look at, another one pager uh, similar to the last one that we looked at. Um, let's see. This red box here contains everything that we want to talk about in this agreement, okay? <clears throat> let's see client must notify inspector in writing any complaints within seven days there's your notice okay otherwise all claims for damages writing out of this complaint are waived that's your waiver clause uh failure to prevail on all causes of action allege shall be liable through attorney's fees okay that's your attorney's fees provision actual damages for the breach contract warning or negligence are limited to the amount of inspection fee paid that's your um, limitation of liability. And then your fourth sentence is your reliance. Okay, four important clauses within one paragraph, none of them sticking out at all 
uh, amongst the others. So take it in one part at a time. Your notice claim and your waiver claim uh, is not conspicuous, does not mention negligence, not enforceable. Attorney's fees clause in there, that's good. I like that. I wish it said uh, that the, the client plays the inspector and not prevailing party, <clears throat> but I'll take it. Third one is limitation of liability clause. We know that doesn't work. And then the reliance one, that's just only good uh, if they don't sign. Okay, all right, that's all I wanted to talk about as far as examples. I wanna hit on a couple of other things that are important to you guys as, as inspectors that are not really related to the inspection agreement. Okay, your insurance policy probably has what's called a consent to settle provision, all right? Most carriers require you guys, or re require this. <clears throat> what this means, this means that the insurance company is not allowed to settle a case out from underneath you, okay? They need your agreement to settle. Look, uh, settling a case where you believe that you didn't do anything wrong, um, is, is tough, okay, I get it. Uh, but I'm here to tell you, if you have an opportunity to settle, just do it, um, just be done with it. You know, you, you're not in a world that is like the normal world that you live in, right? Um, your release that you sign is gonna, it's gonna say specifically that you didn't do anything wrong. You're just settling this to get rid of this meritless lawsuit. Um, there's gonna be confidentiality provisions in it. There's gonna be agreements where they have to drop all claims, including your claims to track or what, you know, whatever your state's governing body is. All those things are gonna be in there to protect you, but sometimes it just really doesn't feel good about giving money to just some knucklehead who's filing a meritless lawsuit. But I'm telling you, it's just get it done. Your life's gonna be so much easier and better resolving the lawsuit um, I don't know if I've ever come across a time where I've told somebody, uh, look, I don't think you should settle. I, I don't think I've, I've never said that. I can confidently say I've never said that. And all the time I'm like, look, just get it done. If you got an opportunity to get out, get back to your normal life, get out and get back to your normal life. No one's ever told me, even if they win in a lawsuit, hey, Jeff, that's great. Can't wait to work with you again. That lawsuit was just super fun. Nobody says that even if they win. OK, um, anyway, we can talk about that if and when we ever get to that. But your consensus settle provision, if they ever come to you and say, uh, look, I need you to consent, do it. Here's another reason why. If you say no and your insurance company could have settled the case at a certain price, let's say the settlement is five thousand dollars and the plaintiff has agreed to accept five thousand dollars to let you out and you say, you know what? I'm not paying them a penny. Your insurance carrier probably can say, you know what? We'll pay the five because they agreed that they'd accept five. You're liable for everything else. So if you lose, you're liable for everything on top of five. And oh, by the way, you're liable for all your attorney fees as you go forward. All right. So, you know, your insurance carrier is going to have that discussion with you if you say no. Um, but some of them, some people are just really, really against settling at all. All right. Let's see if I hit on everything there. Uh, yeah, I don't think I had anything. Oh, so the only caveat I would say to this is I don't know. Every insurance company is different. I don't know what effect settlement will have on your insurance premiums moving forward. That's a conversation you need to have with your insurance agent um, if and when it comes down to settling. I still think you probably would, I, I would recommend settling. All right, <clears throat> to incorporate or not to incorporate. Um, chances are, if you're listening to this, I bet that, that probably 60%, maybe higher uh, are individuals um, or, or individuals doing business as a company name. Here's the deal. In Texas, this is very specific to Texas law. Again, for those folks out of state, uh, I even saw some Canada folks here. This is great. Um, 
I don't know what it is in your state, but um, I would I would recommend that you follow this because I bet you it's similar, if not the same. <laughs> um, the law allows for plaintiffs to recover attorney's fees against individuals and corporate entities. So if you are a person or a DBA, or if you have ink after your name, after your company name, Texas law allows for the plaintiff to recover attorney's fees against you, even if it doesn't say so in the contract, okay? That's important. If you are not a, an individual or an ink, and you are instead an LLP or an LLC, Texas law does not allow for the plaintiffs to um, recover attorney's fees unless it's in the contract. And this is why it's important to say that the inspector can recover against the client, not prevailing party. All right. This is very, very, I, mean, I feel like you guys are getting an honorary law degree from listening to this class. I apologize. It's very legally technical stuff, but it's very important. Um, <clears throat> this is all in, um, in the agreement that I'm going to send to you if you want it. So um, if you're fighting over a $20,000 repair, it can very quickly become fighting over $30,000 of attorney's fees each. I've been at mediations before where the plaintiff is saying that I've got to pay 30 grand in attorney's fees plus $20,000 to fix the roof. And I'm on the other side saying, you know what? You owe me $30,000 in attorney's fees and we're not paying for the roof. And so the vast majority of the damages that are being discussed are attorney's fees. Okay. How nice would it be if you could say to the other side, look, you're not entitled to attorney's fees, but I am. Now it becomes them saying, you owe me 20 grand for the roof. And I'm saying, okay, fine. You owe me 30 grand in fees unless you win. All of a sudden it's equal playing ground, right? That's a big deal. A word on report writing. I'm not going to harp on this. Like I said, you guys get a lot of this from your, from your um, classes that you take. I just want to hit some high points. All right, listen. Don't mark everything as deficient. I love having a, a complaint or a lawsuit filed about a roof or plumbing, and I can go back and say, hey, look, the roof and the plumbing are both marked as deficient, all right? I love that. What I don't like is seeing every single deficient box checked, okay? Because then it becomes a little bit meaningless, all right? <clears throat> it's a little bit of a harder sell. Same thing goes with recommending an expert, all right? If they're suing you because of, um, let's say, the foundation, right? Something's wrong with the foundation, or they allege something's wrong, and you have marked foundation as deficient and gone the extra step of saying, look, you need to get a foundation guy out here, you know, they can find a bunch of more stuff, right? And then they sue you for, for foundation problems, that's awesome, right? I've, I can defend you all day long on that, even without an agreement. I'd love to have an agreement too, but at least I've got some good liability defenses here. A word about mold and termites. All right. Uh, in Texas and probably in most other states, um, believe it or not, even though you're not required to, to report on or inspect for mold or termites, I'm not talking about those inspections. I'm talking about Texas Real Estate Commission, you know, home inspector inspections. Um, one of the most prevalent lawsuits, you know, uh, complaints I get in lawsuits is about mold and termites. Okay. Um, your clients don't know the Trek rules. Okay. Your clients probably think that you're there inspecting also for mold, even if it's in your report that says you're not. Even if it's in your agreement that says you're not, they probably think that. <clears throat> um, so don't, I would prefer, even if you're good at identifying all the visible evidence of either mold, dark powdery substance, evidence of water intrusion, rotted wood, or you're good at 
identifying evidence of termites, right? Tunnels, damaged wood, or set, or et cetera. Keep it at that. Identify the things that are prevalent with either mold or, or termites, but just don't use those words, right? Don't say evidence of mold or anything like that. For God's sakes, don't tell them about a, pla a black powdery substance and then tell them not to worry about it, okay? Don't do that. You're not an expert. Even if you're a mold expert, but you're there doing a Trek investigation, you're not a mold expert in that investigation. Don't bring up mold. Only bring up mold if you're doing a mold inspection. But please don't tell them not to worry about, um, look, that little dirt tunnel over there, that's, that's nothing. Don't worry about that because I guarantee you they're going to be suing you for termites in a year. If you're going to bring it up in your report, please, please, please follow it up with a recommendation for a mold expert or a termite inspection, okay? Or just don't say anything at all. And this, co this goes for verbal comments too, not just in the report, right? Don't be walking around and them say, what do you think about that black stuff by that air intake? up there ah, it's you know they're all like that don't worry about it don't say that please don't say that because even though you're not legally required to report on the presence of mold or inspect for it if you make those comments they can sue you for negligent misrepresentation even if it's not part of your job to do it okay some do's and don'ts all right <clears throat> document everything um Digital storage is cheap. Take as many pictures as you can. The right picture can save you, all right? It can show that there was no penetration, water penetration when you were there. Uh, it can prove that you did in fact go up in the attic when they're accusing you of never even setting foot in the attic, okay? You don't have to use them all in your report, but take, take as many pictures. You can't take too many pictures, bottom line. Once you take pictures and, and you document stuff, maintain it, keep it. Like I said, digital storage is cheap nowadays with the iCloud and you know, whatever, whether even, even if it's on a disc or a thumb drive, whatever. Um, I guess I'm dating myself calling them disc. Uh, <clears throat> maintain everything. Um, I have cases where people had signed agreements, but they can't find them. Okay, keep a hard folder, keep a digital file, do something, but, but keep it. Please don't make the comment, you'd be shocked how many times I hear this, uh, that you would buy the house if the client doesn't. Just, just, just don't say that, it's not good. Juries, juries will, ought, if, if they can prove this is true, and it's gonna be your word against theirs, but juries, if they hear you say that, they're gonna think you're giving it a blessing, okay? They're not gonna listen to anything else. Don't tell the client not to worry about the things in the report. Just focus on the things we talked about. Okay, that's bad. When when it goes south, when you know what hits the fan, you know you're going to want to rely on everything in that report, not just the comments that you made. Also, because chances are you've done 200 inspections since that one they're suing you about, and you don't even remember what you talked about. And that happens all the time. Like I said, don't tell the client not to worry about the black stuff. And it's just just dirt. Be consistent, okay? Don't have conflicting clauses in the agreement. Um, the last two bullets sort of go together. Um, lots of you out there are using word processors and you're using boilerplate or you're reusing reports, okay? Make sure you take all the old stuff out. If you start talking about problems with the upstairs bathroom and there is no upstairs, you're going to immediately lose credibility uh, in your deposition that you actually did a good job, okay? So even if you did a fantastic job, if you have language in there that's conflicting or just doesn't apply, you're going to, uh, you're gonna, you're gonna pay for that uh, in the end. Uh, I just added this, real, this slide real quick. I don't have much juice to it, but um, so Trek complaints. Let's say they don't sue you, they just file a complaint. And for those of you out of state, they file a complaint with whatever your governing body is. I can help with that um, to, to a certain degree. You know, if you want me to you know, take the time and review the whole thing and file a response 
we can talk about how to how to pay for that. But you know, sometimes, most of the time, Trek complaints come at the same time as a lawsuit, and I'll handle that for you, and your insurance carrier will pay me. But if it's just a complaint and it's not a lawsuit, I'm not hired by the insurance company. You and I can work something out. If you just have some questions and you want to talk about it, please call me. I'd be happy to help. Um, and like I said, if it gets too lengthy or something, I'll just tell you. I, I, you know, I'll tell you when we get to the point where I'm going to have to charge you for it. But most of the time, I can just I'll be happy to answer questions for you. Um, and then when I was going through my emails during the break, <clears throat> I noticed um, all a, a lot of you already sending sending me stuff, which is great. I'll get I'll get back to all of you. Um, so that that uh, concludes uh, the presentation part of the of the discussion here. Um, let's start going through some questions. Okay, let's, let me go back here. Let me find the Q&A here for us. All right, it says, <laughs> how would that work in the case of a divorce, the agreement? <laughs> <laughs> those, those clauses are not specific to this, um, to this, right? So in a divorce, I guess what you mean is if you have a um, prenuptial agreement, if you have some sort of contract, um, those, all those things apply. All right. I, I say that I'm, I, I'm pro limitation of liability is probably not going to not going to apply to a divorce situation. Uh, another question: Why can't we just promise to refund the inspection fee? We didn't build the house. The builder should be responsible for repairs, not inspectors. Just inspectors' fees. Well, he's obviously referring to a new construction, new build. So. Um, because, because, like I said, you, you can do a great inspection and get sued, right? I mean, they, they can, any, any person who you do an inspection for can sue you, regardless of what the issue is that they said you missed. But bottom line is they're, they're hiring you to, to, to find stuff, right? They, you know, that you're being hired to find things per the Trek guidelines. They think they're hiring you to find everything. Uh, whatever it is that's, that's wrong or allegedly wrong, they can sue you for it. Uh, can you say, I can give the money back? Yeah, instead of saying, that's really what the limitation of liability is, right? Instead of saying, you know, you owe thousands of dollars, you're saying, I'll, I'll give you back the inspection fee. But, you know, it's not a, without that in the contract, you can't just say, here's your money back, let's pretend no harm, no foul, okay? The, the, the fact is, since you did that inspection, They've looked at the report, they've gone to closing, they've discussed it with the realtor, they've discussed it with the other side, and then they've moved forward relying on the report. So it's not just by offering to give back, it's not gonna get you out, unless you mean that's in the contract. Okay, one, one question about that. Let's, let's go on to it just a little further, Jeff, if you will. Let's say that someone says, okay, I'll take my inspection fee and drop any complaints against you. Don't we need to have something that the client sign as a release of liability at that state? Absolutely. If you're in that situation and that person is willing to release you, um, that it, that's an immediate call to your lawyer. Okay. Whoever it is that you're working with, me, if you don't have anybody, be happy to look. I mean, I've got a one page release I can shoot to you in two seconds. Um, but yes, you don't want to. Uh, I wouldn't feel comfortable with you you know, just giving your 300 bucks back on a, you know, on a promises made in an, in an email <clears throat> to re to release the claims. Yeah. If yeah. you don't do that and that's all you have, I can still fight that. Right. But now you're talking about, again, going to your insurance carrier, paying me to do it because you're talking about a much longer fight. Whereas you could have just a really simple two paragraph, I agree to release you. You agree to pay me 300 bucks. We're never going to sue each other again, blah, blah, blah. Sign, sign, done. Right. And that's, that's sometimes that's a lot simpler than going through the courts or through legal issues with it and a lot less expensive. No doubt. I got another question. So, what's considered a breach of contract? Uh, anything that you promise to do in a contract that you fail to do. That's the most easy way to define a breach. In the case of a home inspection, what that's going to mean is somewhere in that agreement, it's going to say this contract or this, um, this inspection is being performed by a licensed home inspector pursuant to the 
uh, the guidelines set forth by Trek, some kind of language like that. Okay. Now, all of a sudden you have all those Trek standards that you have to go by, right? If you, if those Trek standards say that you're going to look at the plumbing and you don't look at the plumbing, that's a breach of contract. Okay. So <clears throat> if there's a, let's say you do look at the plumbing, you do your job and, and you do everything that's required under Trek, but they end up having a plumbing problem six months down the road, they can still sue you for breach of contract, but that's what the fight's gonna be about. Did you meet your obligations under those Trek standards when it comes to plumbing? And that's my job and your job working together to prove I did A, B, C, D, and E. I don't care what happened six months down the road, I did my job, there was no breach, but they're gonna be arguing the other side. Correct. Always different viewpoints from whoever, whoever's going against you or, or whatever. Uh, they ask, can I get a copy of the agreement? And yes, uh, those agreements are online at the tapria.com or at the internachi.com under the document pages. Uh, any agreements that you use, though, we always recommend you hire your own attorney to review for your particular area and for any uh, issues that's there. Because I know we have people attending this class across the U.S. and Canada. So, you know, make sure that whatever you have as an agreement that it's applicable in your particular area. Yeah, I agree. So so one thing on that, Paul and Brenda, um, like I said, I'm making changes to this thing and I'm sending it to you guys. Um, I, I, I suppose you guys are updating it or, I mean, I don't know how that works, but um, I've got you guys on my email list. So, um, I'm assuming that what's up there is the most current one, but I'll make changes and send those out to anybody that wants them. Um, but like, like Paul said, um, especially if you're in another state or country, um, best case scenario, have some, have a pay the 500 bucks, have a, an attorney review it. Uh, if they can say, Hey, this doesn't really apply in Texas or, or whatever, uh, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, and to answer the question, Jeff, we, we will update it on online so that they have the most current one. So you guys and gals that are listening, uh, make sure you check for the most current agreement because as Jeff said, it is a living document. There will be some changes come on uh, as he does his trial to protect us, uh, represent us. He'll find other things that you know may work better. So we'll update his agreements and make them work for you. All right, uh, when's the best time to have the agreement signed? Before you do the work. Um, yeah, At, or, or the earlier the better is the way to say it. There's several different stages that it can be signed. Um, I prefer you not to give it to them at the same time as you give them the report. But if you do, and it's a signed agreement, I can still work with that. Um, if it's any time after you give them, you do the inspection and give them the report, it becomes more difficult. Certainly, the earlier, the better. And like I said, anybody out there who can send me the information for their um, online system that they have, I'd like to promote that. That's the best way. Um, if you can get it signed. So if you're digital before, before you even show up, right? If you're not digital, I would prefer you get it signed right when you meet them at the inspection, if they're there, um, before you start work. Correct. Uh, yeah, I agree with that, too. <clears throat> what we do personally, Jeff, is we use a program called DocuSign. And we send that, once the client books the inspection with us, we send that DocuSign uh, pre, we call it a pre-inspection agreement, because we want them to sign it, review it before the inspection, they also sign it, plus we have a place for them to put their credit cards. So we actually have them sign the agreement. We get paid before we ever do the inspection. I think that's fantastic. We knock off a few, but in the chats, and you'll see as you, as you look at those chats, there's a lot of different inspection software that offers that program. Okay, uh, Inter InterNACHI offers that free as a program at, uh, for members that they can go in and upload their inspection agreement and send that and have it documented and it's digital. So InterNACHI offers one for free for those anyone that needs That's great. I highly, highly recommend that you take advantage of one of those, one of those programs, one of those services. Um, that's the best way to make sure you get it signed. 
it's going to be signed early, like Paul said before, while everybody's still happy and everybody's in a good mood. And, you know, that's, that's when they're going to sign it and ask the least amount of questions. That's correct. Yeah, I've actually over the years had an uh, attorney represent a client on a commercial job. <clears throat> he wouldn't sign the agreement until he got there. He brought it with him. And he said, I'm going to scratch out this page, this, this uh, section of the agreement. Because uh, what you're telling me is I can't sue you. I said, you're right. Uh, you know, I don't want you to sue me. He said, but I, I represent homeowners against inspectors all the time and business owners. I said, well, then you and I probably aren't the ones that need to work together. So he wouldn't sign it. And I didn't do the inspection. Uh, I told him, I said, find you somebody else. Paul, oh, that is outstanding. I, I, I mean, I'm not going to tell these guys not to do home inspections for attorneys because I'll never be able to get a home inspection done. But if somebody acts like that, if you're if your antenna are up and they're picking apart your contract or they tell you you don't want to sign, man, just go, just run, run as fast as as you can in the other direction. It's not yeah, worth it. Worth it. I have a case right now where a home inspector had that conversation. This lady had a daughter that was a lawyer who said, I'm not signing that agreement. He went on and did the inspection. Sure enough, she sued him. Well, yeah, that's kind of all red, raise a red flag right then, right there. Yeah. The funny thing about the one I was talking about, about the attorney on this commercial job, he told me after I told him I wasn't going to do his inspection, he said, well, he said, I'm going to tell you now. He said, I like some of your clauses. I'm going to steal it and use it on my agreements myself. Well, that's a compliment. Yeah, it must have been a good. I, I took it as a compliment. You know, yeah, I lost money, but hey, it was easier than being sued. Uh, you you probably saved yourself a lot of angst right there. Probably so. Uh, let's see. Question: What happens when you retire from the inspection industry as far as a liability? Doesn't have any effect on it at all. Um, you're still liable for all your inspections that you did until the statute of limitations runs out. So I would say, and it's it's. The time is either two years or four years from the date that they knew or should have known they had a claim. So it does not necessarily mean two years or four years from the date of your inspection. Um, I would assume any reasonable complaint should pop up within six months of the inspection. After that, it gets sort of unreasonable that they didn't that they didn't notice it. So if you're retired and you're or you're thinking about retiring and you want to kind of set the clock as to when you can breathe easy, I would say probably four years from the date that you perform four years and six months from the date you performed your last inspection. That seems like a long time. Uh, and quite, quite frankly, the longer you go, the less likely it is. Uh, certainly two years and six months, you can, you can take a, a pretty significant sigh of relief, especially if you have a really good contract. Um, but no, just because you're retired does not mean they can't sue you. Correct. Now, one, one thing on that, I will tell everyone, if you have your e &O insurance, you're, you can get what's called tail coverage. That will provide some coverage after you retire for whatever period of time you want. So check with the insurance carrier for tail coverage. That's what it's called in our industry. Uh, let's see. Uh, so it seems that anything can be called breach of contract. What's the limits on that? Yeah got to be they've got to be able to point to some verbiage in the agreement they can't just you know impose some kind of obligation and say you agreed to it if they can't point to written information whether it's in the contract or in the trek rules they got to go back and point to it now oftentimes i'm trying to nail them down and find out where in the agreement are you saying you you broke it you breached it um and they have a hard time you know, nailing that down because they don't know. They have no, when they file that breach contract lawsuit, they, those lawyers don't even know that TREC rules exist. I right. guarantee you. So when I go, and let's use mold, for example, I'm suing you because um, my house has mold and you were supposed to inspect for mold and you didn't, and it's full of mold. So I go back at them and I, and I, I educate them. Look, here's a copy of the TREC rules that say, they're not required to report or inspect for mold, period. So you've got no breach of contract claim. And some of them will say, okay. And, and some of them will just make up something else to, to sue you for just because you're in the lawsuit and they want to keep you in. So yeah, there are limits. Okay. Uh, 
more of a comma here. It says, I'm going to read it to you. It says, few things. I do plaintiff and defense work was an arbitrator for two years. I mediate cases and work as a trial expert in my background. I do want people to understand that gross negligence under the Trek standards allow them to easily pierce a contract and the carriers will settle it out of fear of a Supreme Court ruling against the limits of liability. Inspectors need to understand that standards of practice is the best protection and then the limits of liability protects them from that of a jackass that follows a suit that's truly frivolous. So basically it's saying to keep with the standard practice. Yep. Another one said, not a question, more of a comment it says, my limit of li liability arbitration limitations of actions or dispute and third party and uh, subrogation clauses are bold box and each box initialed by the class, just a thought. Yeah, initials are great. I've seen that before. That's hard for them to argue. I didn't see it if their initials are right next to it. Yeah, he yep. says no signed contract, no inspection. Walk away. I agree. I totally agree. Uh, let's look, I, I, I wish that I lived in the day when, you know, everything was handshake and you could trust a person. But the fact is, we just don't anymore. And you can do a fabulous job for 35 years and spend the first five years of your retirement fretting about a frivolous lawsuit. Yeah. So um, I'm just I'm just telling you, from my perspective, uh, it's easy to do. It'll save you a ton of um, frustration. I agree. Let's see. Uh, someone comments that the internet. Well, this isn't for you so much, but they comment the internachis document library is worthless because they can't highlight but what you have to do on that is just download the, the file and save it as a word doc or page or whatever you're using then you can adjust it and load it back up and use it for your own so yeah. what they have is just samples for you yeah uh, so can you put a settlement limit examples of max settlement being price of the inspection can you add that to the agreement um i think all you're doing real in that situation is just you know calling a limitation of liability something else the law is going to look at that as a limitation of liability whether it's a settlement or a verdict or uh, an arbitrator award or whatever um yeah you're just that's just calling a limitation of liability something else but that's exactly what it is okay just a question how long should we keep reports and photos uh, so same question as how long they have to, to sue you, right? I would say um, four and a half ish years after your inspection uh, is probably a, a reasonable time. Um, if you want to just make it safe, your, you know, your document retention plan should be five years, five, five years from the date of the inspection. But again, <clears throat> I mean, I, we don't have a document retention plan here. I've got, I can go back and look at home inspector cases I did 15 years ago. So um, it's cheap. I can pull up pictures and reports, whatever, emails. I can pull all that stuff up. So it's super cheap to save things. Uh, if you're using a um, computer system, I don't know why you would even delete it. Um, if you're using a, a hard copy document system, um, I'd urge you to, to convert to digital because I have a case where somebody, like I said, they, they kept, um, they, they signed agreements and everything was great. He gave me a copy of a draft agreement. He's like, this is the one they signed, but he didn't have the sign one because his attic burned. Hmm. And of course the plaintiff's going to say, I never signed anything. Of course. So keep it. All right. Uh, since he says, since I'll be using a drone for some roof inspection, do I add that to my pre-inspection agreement or have an addendum only when I need to use a drone? Um, a dr you're saying drawing? Drone. Oh, a drone. I'm sorry. A drone. What was your Texas accent? I was getting confused. <laughs> All right, Don't start picking on it. <laughs> a drone. Um, <clears throat> I don't think, I mean, I don't know that you even really need to add that in there. Um, maybe if you want to add some language in there, whoever that is, email me and we can kind of talk about that. But I think 
if you add something in there just to let them know, look, this is not a requirement um, pursuant to track or anything else. This is just an aid in the inspection. I certainly don't want it to impose any, you know, higher level of standard of care for you. I think it would be very similar to using infrared or some other technology. Um, to me, that's just another tool in your toolbox to, to use. It shouldn't, um, it shouldn't impose a higher, the inspector that uses infrared should not be held to a higher standard as somebody who's not. Um, but I think something in the agreement that talks about that, hey, we're gonna use this FYI, um, this doesn't impose a higher level of, of um, duty of care for us. We're still subject to the same TREC rules and guidelines. Something like that I probably would like to see. Um, other than that, I'd probably just have to think about how else that would affect uh, you. But certainly if you use it um, and you've got photos in there, or if you see something you know, from, a, from a drone photo um, that you otherwise wouldn't have seen, obviously comment on that. But uh, other than that, I think just a line or two in a contract that says, hey, look, I'm using these newfangled you know, pieces of equipment here, but it doesn't change my duties under track would be great. Yeah, it's, I, I'm not, I may have to differ with you on that one because the uh, Texas laws that govern inspectors uh, and track goes into, if we use any specialized uh, equipment such as infrared, or drone or sewage camera that you have to be qualified in that particular area to do it. So that kind of goes beyond the, the standard Trek inspection, Texas Real Estate Commission inspection, and it becomes more of a specialized deal. So uh, yeah. I'm not sure how that would work in the agreement, but under the Trek's rules or regulations, that they do hold you to a higher standard. So I th that's, that, that's a really good point. And I think where, I, I think where that would fall out is that would affect you in your track complaint, um, but the standard of care in a in a trial um, would be just pursuant to the to the track. Oh, maybe if it's track standards, if they say that, is that actually in the track standards or is that somewhere it's else in track? The rules and regulations of track. Okay, well then, then yeah, yeah, I guess their their interpretation because I've had those discussions with the attorneys. Their interpretation of that is you have to be qualified to do that, and that opens a broad range. Yeah. You know, did you take training for that particular instrument so okay. yeah they really they really get on it on that one that's a good point paul and that's something i've never had before i've had people using infrared before never had any kind of dispute about about a drone um so yeah then i would then i then, then if it does raise the level um of standard of care for for that particular inspector then then it, it is what it is that's what it does um so yeah, it actually gets into the to the federal aviation part of it too, where they have to be licensed to fly it commercially, which yeah. is what the inspectors consider doing commercially. So that's exactly the point I was going to make. I am aware of that. If you're going to use it in a commercial environment, you are required to have some level of awesome. certification. Yeah. yeah. So and you know the bad thing is, but if you fly it and the wind catches it, and you fly through somebody's window and breaks it. And you don't have that certification or license, then you just open up a big can of worms. Mm -hmm. So just just a thought on that. Let's see what else we got. Uh, when an inspector arrives at an inspection and the utility is not on, any recommendations or cautions when departing from a specific system or component? Just to make sure that you document that, because obviously there's some things that you're not going to be able to do when you're there. Um, and you're going to want to, doc, to document in your report that that was the case, right? If you don't document that, and later on they find out that some lighting component or some something, some water didn't, you know, work effectively, um, they're going to say it was on, and you're going to say it wasn't, right? Even if you, you're probably not going to remember it. Like I said, that happens all the time. Rarely does a home inspector remember the details about an inspection they're being sued on because it's just happened so far down the road. Um, um, but I would just, I would just make sure to document it. Right. Yeah. When the gas is off, always take a picture of the meter showing this off. Put that in your report. So the water is the same way. Uh, let's see. The Do you have any comments regarding an agreement for non trek inspections? In other words, a lot of these guys will do commercial properties 
or they'll do builders inspections, new construction or code inspections. Um, the only thing I would say is I, I, I don't, um, I don't remember if I've ever defended somebody in a situation like that, but for the bulk of what we talk about here today, your inspection agreement, all those things would apply. Um, so, you know, you're just, the difference in that scenario would be that you're, you're being held to a, the standard of care of what a reasonable inspector under those same or similar circumstances would have done. Whereas in the Trek, um, in the Trek world, it's pretty, you know, you know exactly what those standards are, okay? Right. It's, so it's a little bit more general, but really kind of same thing. You just, you're supposed to do what a reasonable inspector would have done. But as far as the contract goes, those things all apply, Trek or not. Okay, somebody asked, would you share your contact information in the chat or on screen again before we end up? Uh, yep. Several of them saying thank you and appreciate the uh, class. Let's see what else. Uh, let me go back. I've got I've, someone put it in the chat, someone put it in the Q&A, so I'm, I'm looking at both of them here. I think that pretty well sums it up on it. Yeah, I think that's what we've got. Uh, let me just say I want to tell you how much we appreciate you doing this class, and uh, it's, it's been an awesome class. I appreciate you updating it and your willingness to look at the inspection agreements. Uh, that is that is quite a value for, for our members and people that are listening to, the, to this presentation. I would like to tell everyone, if you are a Texas licensed inspector, please put your Trek, your name, Trek license number uh, in the chat box for us so we can get it and uh, make sure you include your full name as Trek has it on your license and your inspector's license number so you can get credit for this class and just put that in the chat box and we'll download it and get it for you. But you will be, if you haven't taken this class previously, you will receive two hours of Texas Real Estate Commission inspectors continued education hours for this class. So I, I just pulled it up when I was, I, for those of you who were asking, I put all my contact information on the, in the chat. And as I saw that, I saw another question. Um, to protect myself, is it wise to get a, get a positive review after the inspection? Can that be of assistance? Um, so I assume you mean some sort of, um, you know, um, social media sort of positive uh, Yelp review or something like that. Uh, absolutely. Um, it's not going to be dispositive. Like it's not, you know, if they write, hey, inspector did a great job, uh, it's not going to mean that I can get you out based on that. But I can certainly make some hay with that in a deposition. Look, you wrote this thing, you know, two months after you did the he did the inspection. You were certainly happy with him at that time, right? Yes. Um, and but they're just going to say, well, I didn't know about everything until somebody else looked at it or, or whatever. But yeah, no, it's certainly, you know, if you're doing reviews, I would urge you to send it to everybody, right? And if they if they do a positive review, that's that's helpful not from a legal standpoint, but more from a factual standpoint. Okay, good. All right, and Jeff, you did say that if the uh, people attending this class will send you their inspection agreement that you'll review it for them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so last time I did this class, I was only working for one insurance carrier. Um, and quite frankly, I thought it was the one that was handling most of the um, inspector cases in, in Texas, at least, come to find out there was a ton of them. And so since then, I've, I've be, gotten hired by two additional ones, including the one that InterNACHI works for or works with. So um, if you're, if you're, you know, if you're going through insurance through InterNACHI, you know, I, I would be the point person. Uh, if you get sued, I would, you know, I'd, love to represent you if you found somebody else that you like by all means and you're comfortable with by all means use them if you don't have somebody re request that your insurance carrier use me i'd love to do the work for you i'm always trying to build this part of my practice um but in the meantime i'd be happy to i've been doing this for so long i can i can look at a contract in, in two seconds and tell you what you need to so it's not it doesn't take up much of my time be happy to look at it uh you've got my email You've got my phone number, always be willing to talk to you guys. Um, and that includes, you know, a year from now, if, if you're feeling a little queasy about how this one client is treating you 
and you want to make sure you're sort of dotting your I's and crossing your T's, call me. Let's talk about it. Be happy to help. Love, love representing you guys. I hope you found it useful. Be happy to do it again. And in the meantime, I'd be happy to, uh, um, to talk to you if you have questions. All right, Jeff, we appreciate it. Appreciate your time and effort on it and greatly appreciate it. I can personally rep uh, recommend Jeff. He represented us in a lawsuit against our company several years back, how we first came in contact with Jeff and we got a demand letter for $10 million. So I wanted to know if I just write a check or what do I do, you know? I mean, the check would be about as good as his lawsuit was. But anyway, after firing my first attorney, I went to Jeff and Jeff had the thing dismissed for us. So. Uh, I much appreciate that and have the most highest respect for Jeff. So if you need a good attorney, I highly recommend him. So uh, we, send, we send a lot of inspectors his way whenever there's issues. So if you call me and say, I need an attorney, Jeff's the name you're going to get from me. So, all right. I have to thank everyone for attending. I hope you enjoyed the seminar. And uh, uh, if you got questions or something, you can email us or email Jeff. And uh, Jeff, would you verbally give us your email one more time? Sure, sure. It's G E O F F dot Benny, B as in boy, I N N E Y, at G K B K law dot com. Jeff dot Benny at G K B K law dot com. All right. All right. I appreciate it, Jeff. Thank you for your time. Thanks for attending, and we'll go ahead and end the meeting now. Well, have a great day. All right. Thanks, you too.